Because one of the old ways, like I'd look at relationships is if I would have fights in the relationship, it always meant something was wrong. What if conflict and fights in relationships actually meant that something was right? It's kind mm. of a crazy concept, right? But conflict in, in, in people being different and thinking about things differently, inherently, it's not bad. It actually has a huge opportunity to bring you closer depending on how you deal with it. This is going to be fun. We have uh, none other than me, amigo, Jordan Carroll. What's up, brother? Man, your Spanish is so good, dude. You, I know, you like I know. Two, you drop like two amigos <laughs> in uh, two sentences, so you're pretty much fluent. So we have a doc here, and we might have to change it to Spanish if uh, yeah. if I keep up this rapid pace. It's, it's, um, it's happening. It's happening. So we had this idea like a month ago, maybe about ways that you and I can maybe stay in touch. We're each always like kind of curious about random different things. You've been doing this travel nomad entrepreneurship life for quite a while now. And you've taught me a lot of tricks of the trade. And um, we had the, the, the pleasure, I think it was a uh, pleasure for me. I don't know about for you to to live together in in a few of these countries in uh in colombia and <laughs> have you ever Mexico. got feedback on everything you do no i'm just kidding <laughs> the idea was as all great ideas start in a, in a google doc we threw mm. a few things in there and uh and could, and could talk about them we're gonna we're gonna keep it just to like things we're learning and interesting stuff but also we're very open to whatever happens and we have a few things here in the doc, but we might go off doc. So we'll see. Uh, we'll see what happens. Did I sum up everything, Jordan? Great. Yeah. Great context. I think, I think an important thing to mention, or maybe we, where we even start is just about how ideas come to formulation for both of us and how this kind of thing manifests. And I guess creatively, we've both seen ways that we're like, oh, I want to work with this person. And when you live with you, you live with somebody like both of us being able to travel and work from around the world, but then both taking the opportunity to live with each other. It's very interesting because you see the other person up close, like how they do on the, you know, things on the daily. And then you also have chances to get feedback loops from that person. And you have maybe ideas that are, that are born from that. And yeah, it's interesting how we just had a call last month and we're just like, Hey, why don't we just start fil like recording a podcast together? And there's, I think there's a lot of, times in my life where I've had a lot of resistance to start things, but when I'm doing them with other people who are, you know, motivated or I look up to, I admire in different ways, it makes things a lot easier. So for you to also suggest it or want to do it, I think, I think there's a lesson in there already of just us putting this together and saying, Hey, I don't know what this is going to be. We've got a Google doc, which is the kind of bare essential of what you need for anything, I guess, collaboratively. And we're like, all right, we've got a bunch of topics here. Sheet. And we even had a conversation before this. We're like, all right, should we go through this and outline what we're going to talk about? It's like, oh, we can go back and forth or we could just take this wherever it goes. And that's how our conversations go anyway. So I'm excited for what this could become and what kind of feedback we can get from it. But um, yeah. Yeah. I think also worth highlighting, it makes me think of like structuring either bets for our life or projects into like a win-win or like in this case, the phrase that comes to mind is like two birds, one stone. So like, I think about this with my writing where zero people can, can read the newsletter or the blog and I still like learn stuff out of it. And so same here, like zero people can listen to this podcast. I don't even know where we're going to put this. I don't even know if we're going to make it into a podcast, but like you and I get to catch up and learn stuff. And so that's a win within itself. And if we are enjoying it, chances are other people might as well. So that's like, I think a handy little way to think about taking on new projects for anyone listening. Like, oh, I always thought this would be cool or that would be cool. It also teaches us more about content, something yeah. we're into. And I just had, even if the rest of this episode is a complete flop, I just had the, gate, the greatest gift in a reminder setting this up of like, used to always sort of prepare, you know, hope for the best, prepare for the worst. And have these, like, I literally have this, like, travel electronics purse, if you could see, with all these, like, 
random gadgets and extra earbuds and and then like the simple usually the airpods work for this but they kept on not working at the beginning of this this call and i have a few more coming up this week and so it's a good reminder of like you know just use the wired ones they yeah. work so i'm always have insurance i guess well, first lesson of the week for me yeah i mean even beyond that it's like I think we got to this place in our society, in our culture, especially with electronics that we're always focused on like the new thing that is out, but we forget that there are just things that work. And I think one of the gripes that a lot of people had about Apple is that they always end up changing their stuff. So like they go to the USB-C or they, you know, they do X, Y, and Z to get rid of like the headphone jacks. And yeah, initially I was like really upset about that because I was like, damn, like I have all these headphones that work really well. And I've still found that with most calls or most podcasts or most things, it's like wired headphones. It's just like, it's easy, man. It works. So where else in life are there things that just work? And we try to create like all these, like you said, efficiencies or, or you know, it's, it seems like it'd be easier just to have the headphones in and it's Bluetooth and it just connects. And uh, But when that stuff doesn't work and you can just pop this thing in the headphone jack, it seems kind of obvious. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Uh, so that was a good lesson for me. The other thing I want to talk about is just other general observations. So I have a, I have a few and I started a note of just like, you know, travel observations or Buenos Aires or Colombia or wherever, but I'm starting to realize that in general, I think like the really good content or the takeaways are like very specific observations. It's that like, if you're reading an email, it's the copy that it sounds like they're talking to you or it's a thing where it's like, oh, I've, I've noticed that too, but I've never put that together. And so I am making it part of my practice of just to like observe things and to keep a list of those observations, whether it's travel or whatnot. I've also experienced this as well, but have you ever passed a kidney stone? No, but I had five or six gall stones and I had to get my gall bladder removed which ended up uh, becoming a surgery, but no, I haven't had kidney stones. This happened to me years ago and I haven't really thought much, like I sort of adjusted or whatever, but I re replied to a tweet the other day and then I put something in my newsletter today about this. Um, so basically in 2016, I passed a kidney stone and like got really curious why. Basically I was eating a lot of spinach. There's tons of oxalate in spinach. I had no idea what oxalate was. I went down all the rabbit holes. Basically oxalate is what causes calcium-based kidney stones, blah, 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 blah. But since I put that out and since I've talked to a few people, like I was researching it, uh, a few people replied to my newsletter and I'm hearing more and more about all these people with kidney stones or, or their wife had a kidney stone, a lot more girls than women than I thought. And so I was looking at the numbers, listen to these numbers, the rates. So over 500,000 people go to the ER for kidney stones each year. One in 10 people in the US will have a, a kidney stone at some point in their life. And the numbers is like rapidly growing. In the 70s, there was a 3.8% chance you'd get one. In the 2000s, there's an 8.8% .8 chance. And now there's greater than 11% chance that you'll get one. And like anecdotally, I just know of so many people that, that are getting them. And then you, your chances of getting one are far greater if, if you've had one before. But I don't know. Again, just an observation of this random thing I thought was random to me. But the beauty of like kind of putting out content is like you... You can make this thing and then like all of a sudden have this new bond of with all these people. You're like, oh my gosh, like one lady was like, oh, this is happening to my son. Like I'm going to share this, this chart of food. There's like top foods to avoid. And so, um, I, yeah, I don't know. I don't know where I was going with that other than drink water and don't eat spinach out there. Yeah. Well, I think interesting for me, similar to your situation, I, I documented my journey with the gallbladder and I didn't realize how many people have had their gallbladder removed. And it's one of those things where it's like, it's like the breakup, what's the, the breakup with the girl. And then you, you remember her car and then all of a sudden you see her car everywhere. And it's, it's yeah. that make and model. Like we selectively yeah, yeah. choose things to see. And so there's likely been all these people with kidney stones around you all this time. But then we, when we go through something personally, there's some type of bias that occurs where now all of a sudden we see it and like in, in everything. Yeah. It's an interesting phenomenon. And I think that's something that's, happened to me in my life again with the gallbladder. It's happened in different perspectives. Like once I learned something that I didn't know before and all of a sudden I'm like, oh, I see this everywhere now. Yeah, and I think like the other takeaway for me and anybody who's thinking about making content or like, you know, what do I talk about? 
I remember I've done a handful of these online writing courses and they're great. Highly recommend them. But also it's just like, um, I remember being in the middle of one, they're like, all right, you know, tell your story. Like what are unique experiences that you've had? You could do like, you know, my first, my first date, my first car, my first blah, 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 blah or like unique random things, going to the ER, having a kid, blah, blah, blah. And so like, I actually had written the, this blog post in a Google doc. And when I went back through there and at the time of, of taking these courses, I was just overwhelmed with optionality. I was like, I don't know what to write about. Like, will people like this? Like, you know, not a lot of confidence in like the writing ability and if it would actually be useful for anyone. And then when I went back through here, I was like, oh, I, I literally already wrote, you know, the whole thing, which is the hardest part is just starting something. And I edited it a, a decent amount and, and added a few things. But the thing that got me over the edge to like go back and actually write this and publish it and to put it in the newsletter was like, you know, I, I could, I could research a million frameworks that people may or may not use or whatever. But like, I had already gotten the feedback that this lady was going to share it with her son. So it was like, oh, this feels really good that I'm like helping somebody. And that is going to be like one of the, the things I look for now of like, what can I actually do to help somebody? I, I think all this stuff like helps somebody in some way, but like, that is a real painful experience that uh, hopefully I could prevent it for somebody. And so I don't know if, if anybody's making content or thinking about that and has a story to tell it's counterintuitive, but like the things that have the smaller, more specific niche audience is actually, I would say a good place to start because you could be a master of that domain and be the expert there. And the internet has like a crazy way of finding those people versus less like a vague thing of like, Oh, this is for everybody. Yeah. And it speaks to like, create your transformations and your content and whatever it is that you're doing for just one person, like a one person audience. Oftentimes I think where you're going with that is the most relatable one person audience is past you. So it's like, how do I look at past me, see what I was dealing with and then help that past me solve the problem and document that. And all of a sudden now you've got the, you know, the, the mom reaching out to you like that. Yeah, totally. With looking at your past self, is there anything that, that sticks out? I feel like you have had a, an especially like, um, transformational period of your life through, I don't know, different chapters of, uh, where you were earlier compared to where you are yeah. now. Is there anything sticking out for you or just yeah. like, yo, I, I know this is one thing I would tell younger Jordan wearing a backwards hat and a Boston, uh, Jersey <laughs> that, uh, yeah, still wearing those jerseys. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I've worn a hat in a while though, because I don't think it really fits with the broccoli on my head, dude. The, yeah, the I'd say the alcohol stuff because that that one people I've been asked before, like, what's the most you know what am I most proud of in my life? And one of the first things that comes up is quitting alcohol and looking at my past self and what's actually served a lot of people was me documenting the process and talking about quitting alcohol. Like I still mm. as they get, cause I basically, I put out a blog about it. I put out a couple videos about it. I'm now coming up this, this year in August will be five years without any alcohol. If you would have told me like 10 years ago or even six years ago, it's like, Oh, you'd be sober from alcohol for five years. It's like, wow, I, I probably wouldn't have known that. So when I speak to old Jordan, this is basically what I had been doing when I talked about my journey with alcohol. And yeah, I, I just like, like I said, I continue to get messages to this day from something that I put out, you know, years ago. I think I, I put out most of that stuff. Like when I hit my one year and two year mark, I do like a, an anniversary post every year. But other than that, I haven't put out like videos or blogs since, but still get, you know, people reaching out. Yeah, I'll bet. I mean, that's such like a big part of your story and I'll bet relatable to a lot of people, especially nowadays. I read this thing a while ago that's always stuck with me is alcohol is the only drug in the world where people think something's wrong with you if you don't use it. Yeah. And it's just like, it's so common. Like, oh, grab a drink here, or there. But like over the last couple of years, maybe it's because I've maybe consumed it less, but I think as a society, people are more like, oh yeah, I actually don't like feeling miserable the day after, and I don't like doing dumb stuff. It's becoming a, a viable option to a lot of people. A lot, a lot um, more knowledge and awareness around it. When uh, some of these other drugs have been decriminalized, 
we've taken yeah. a harder look at alcohol almost as in reference and in context to like marijuana or something. It's like people say like, why is marijuana illegal? But alcohol's not. And those kind of conversations I feel like bring about a lot of like the actual awareness of how poisonous alcohol is. And I mean, it's, it's literally a depressant. It's super toxic for you. And I know plenty of people that moderate it and drink their glass of wine or whatever a couple of times a week or every day, what, like whatever it is, like I don't, I don't have any room to judge people. And I think that's maybe even another lesson of, of what it's taught me is there's kind of an ego based way to do things and reflect on things where it's like, I can put myself on a pedestal, but I really try not to do that because there's not any room for me to judge <laughs> anyone when it comes to that kind of thing. And mostly anything in life, I try to reserve that judgment as much as possible. Right. Right. Nice. Let's, let's maybe go through some of this doc and or whether it's in the doc or not of um just thinking about like more recently i've been doing this travel thing and have been learning a lot i think more and more people are traveling and it's been interesting to sort of help them on their journeys of like yo even if it's just like hey i'm going to columbia like you know what should i do and share a doc or just like thinking through things i've learned is there anything that you've learned over the years that you think is most underrated or like overlooked as it relates to traveling or digital nomads or anything like that? I feel like you probably have a really good perspective on this because you started more recently. It's like sometimes when you have been so long doing something, you kind of forget what it's like to first start. So it's almost mm. like the not, you know, not complete parallel, but it's like, Sometimes if you're looking for an instructor, you don't look for the Olympic medalist. You look for the person who got further ahead just recently and is just a few meters ahead, whatever. I would say, mm -hmm. if I did have to answer that question, I think for me what's coming up is really optimization of workspace for productivity and for comfort and just really investing in so this is assuming people are working when they're traveling. So digital, you know, digital nomad that way, but just like really tricking out like slow travel for one. So it's traveling to places for at least three months at a time and like not getting in. Like if you really want to be optimal in your mental health and your working and your productivity is important, then from my personal experience, needing to travel even a month at, at a time can be very difficult to like get set in your routines. So I like longer term stays starting at three months, like a quarter at a time in a place mm. just because it gives you that additional runway. And then in those three months, like really optimizing, like t tweaking and tuning and optimizing like that first month is super crucial to the optimization of all your routines, of your workspace area, of your gym, of, how you get your groceries, like all those things. And I find that that for me is I'm, I'm obviously in Playa del Carmen. I've been here for quite some time and I, I'm actually going to be signing a six month lease. I haven't told you this yet, but oh. I'll be signing a six month lease shortly with my girlfriend. We're moving in together. So this will be a whole new wow. experiment. Yeah. Nice. When's that start? Uh, April. Yeah. Late, late March, April, but we did find a, a really nice two bedroom place. So I think that that's kind of, also just, yeah, like optimizing your space. Like if you're living with someone else, like for us, it's, we're just like, yeah, we really want to have separate spaces for work, separate spaces. Mm -hmm. Like if you need a nap during the day or whatever, like just having the options I think is, um, is great. Yeah. For me, one of the things I've noticed is like, if you want to get to know a place, you know, say I, when I got to Buenos Aires, there's this like digital nomad WhatsApp groups. There's like a housing WhatsApp group, like all these, all these places have WhatsApp groups, which is great because you get to learn about like what's going on, what's like the exchange mm. rate all about, where do you go, what's go, what are the events, what do you do, what do you not do, yeah, um, what's potentially dangerous. But like I've struggled with a couple things. One, just keeping up with them all. Like it yeah, gets to yeah, the point impossible. where I, I join a couple, and like I find myself. Like I have a WhatsApp of just like tons of unread group messages, but then like my friends messages there, I notice I just kind of start to neglect too. So like, I, I actually need to go back and go through, it, it creates this like stressor in my life because I, I, 
I know I have things that I, I, I need to go back to. And I also like can't go through all the WhatsApp things. So like, I think it'd be a cool service to have like almost a liaison on, you know, take the top 20 places, travel places. And they're like the boots on the ground that, that metaphorically that they might be there too. But like uh, just highlighting the coolest stuff, events that are going on or like, Hey, here are the, the kind of like what you talked about that first month yeah. of like literally those things for like grocery delivery or uh, meal delivery, water delivery, like these things that we did in, in um, both Colombia and Mexico, but I got here and I was like, oh yeah, I'll, I'll figure that out one day. But like the, the whole first month I didn't do those things yeah, yeah. and I was like, damn, I need to do those things. And as soon as I have it, I have like a food delivery that comes uh, like three meals, like three times a week, water delivery, like big jugs. It is just so much easier and better but it took me a while to kind of be like, okay, I know I want those. I need to go in the WhatsApp groups, find them, blah, blah, blah. But like having that. And then now my next struggle is where do I go next? And like, how do I minimize that time to say like, okay, if I were to go to Brazil, yeah, say, yeah. like, I don't know who is that sort of liaison to, to help me kind of get set up. And like, how do I maybe even talk to that person before to say like, yo, would I like Rio? I like like running outside. It sounds kind of dangerous. Is that okay? Is that not okay? Those sort of things. How, how have you navigated like planning, the planning component? You, you, you like to plan things. Yeah. I think what's interesting, this brings me to another, I don't know if it's a tip or a hack or whatever, but I think it's getting integrated with the connectors of each city. Cause you'll notice like within certain cities, especially like hotspots, there's usually some people that are like the most connected, like they've been there for a long time. Mm. Like the attributes you might look for is they've been there for a long time. They've been all, they've been through all the seasons. They're part of different communities. They have maybe similar mindset to you and you just latch on to not latching onto them, like in a negative way, but just figure out who those few center pieces are of that, of that community. And yeah, it's like when you go to a new place, a lot of your experience rests on, who you engage with very at the very beginning, because they are the people that have the opportunity to help you spread to those second and third connections. And so like, like for instance, with you, it's like, you knew that when I introduced you to Kristen, for instance, like I knew that she had been there for a long time. I knew that she potentially knew of any particular resource that you could, you could possibly need. And then you also knew of the guy, Carl. And like, th there's just like people that, you know, are, like in these communities and they are just like staples. So they're going to be able to get you out to those broader places. And then there's like that kind of more mechanical stuff, like you said of the food delivery. And I've thought of a business for that for a while, like a directory that I want to create. And I think that's still a very viable option, but yeah, even like with the water service, like I, I'm struggling to like get these water guys to come. <laughs> remember, you remember them from next from Playa? <laughs> Like, I do. Yeah, there's like these little things and it's interesting, like some sort of concierge or some sort of thing if you just land and there's a lot of customization around that. But there'd still be some bias and that's where it's kind of interesting. It's like maybe you fill out a survey or you do something and then there's some sort of onboarding that gets you like a customized view of Buenos Aires based on the different things that you want. But I don't know what that would look like. Yeah. And there are a few groups too of like, if someone's listening, it's like, yo, I don't, I don't have, I don't know anybody in these places yeah. or I don't know what I don't know. Um, I think that nomad lifts has been, has been helpful for me. That's like probably a wider net for like, yeah. it's just people traveling. Yeah, starting with um, those ones. Good. Yeah. Like I'm on remote, yeah. I'm remote year, dynamite circle, nomad base. I have those three communities as my main communities. I also have nomad list, but I can logged in like twice because I find it's a little bit more random, but yeah, finding the broader communities that, hey, there's a bunch of people in that city already that, you know, are pre-qualified. That's fucking awesome. Right. Real quick, where should I go next in South America? You know what I'm going to tell you? I want you to come back here, but... <laughs> in, 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 in South America. I know, that, I, know uh... I know. Okay, so where should you go next? Well, I think that leads you down a string of questions that you need to ask yourself. So I look at life in different seasons, right? Like I look at what's important in that season to get you. And this is more of an intuitive thing. It's like, do I feel like I'm super in the flow of life? Like where I can go and I want to do a lot of adventures and I want to like 
hang and stuff. I don't get the impression that that's really you ever. I feel like you're more like always needing structure, always needing X, Y, Z. And then I'd also like be curious how, like I'd, I'd look at that first and then I kind of go down the line of like, well, who do you know somewhere that you want to be around too? Cause I think that that's actually a really, mm. a really good metric is if you want to go to a new place, like great, then where are people hanging out that are in your network already? That could be that initial core group for you that can drive like some of that stuff that you said that drive an easy, like, cause remember when you came with me to apply, did you have an easier time getting acclimated in Playa or Buenos Aires? Playa, a thousand percent. Okay. So why was that? Yeah. I think the people like you're talking about, I knew you, you knew everyone. There was like ongoing events, very, yeah, like walkable to things and like, yeah, it, 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 was, it was such a low lift to go to say an event like yeah. Buenos Aires is a lot more spread out and yeah, the, 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 the people for sure. So maybe we start with what's important in your season right now for you. Yeah, I think that it's, it's let people will be like, oh, you know, how's, how's Buenos Aires? Are you, you know, are you like going bungee jumping? And I'm like, no, I haven't, like, I'm not opposed to that. Sounds fun. But like, um, I just happen to be living my life here versus like Austin or Columbia or some of these others. So in all these places, connection with people is always very important to me. And like yeah. one of those things where it's like, I was going to an event a couple of weeks ago and I was um, thinking to myself, it's like, there's always that initial resistance to go to a new event and like probably 10 times, we'll call it nine times out of 10, you leave that event and be like, Oh, I'm so glad I went to that. I can't believe I was like, like talk, almost talking myself out and not going, you know, a couple hours before. And so wherever those things are, where there are people there, I think also joining Dynamite Circle has been really helpful. Met up with a couple of people from that group a couple of weeks ago, and I could totally see how people that so Dynamite Circle is just like business community, very impressive, like cool entrepreneurs in there. And Jordan's a member of it as well. And we, there's a good community of people in Playa. There were a couple of people in Buenos Aires and they have these like, I don't know, like bigger events ish throughout the year and in, in some of these places. And it seems like people will use those as like, oh, I'm going to go to the uh, Dynamite Circle event in London in July, I think it is. And then like kind of go from there. So I was thinking about maybe using one of those events as like a catalyst point of like, one, it's in a cool city. Two, it will check the box of cool people. And then it at least be like, okay, here, I, I have that. Then I'll go from there. There's, there's one in Mexico City coming up in April. And then right after that, they're planning one for Playa too. I will be in Lisbon for part of that time. So uh, I'll be kind of missing both. But <laughs> but if you mm. send your trip on either side of that, I would see. I think, I think for nice. you, man, it's, it's like, yeah. So to extend that question of what's important to you, I kind of look at different factors like, what's important in work right now, what's important in play right now. And if, if the play is like, oh, I want to be near a beach. I want to like have a lot of volleyball time. I want to have a lot of dancing, you know, like whatever. Then I look for the, the places where that already exists. And then I look for people in my network that are already those, those core uh, connecting pieces. And that's how I would decide is through conversation with those people. And again, if you don't have those people, then you have to generate those people usually from other communities like we talked about. And I think that that can be really useful. Yeah, nice. That's that's helpful. Let's maybe go through um, other things that people listening can might, might also get benefit out of. Uh, is there anything in this last month, either things that you have in the stock or things in this last few months that you've learned, discovered, uh, are excited about? I'm always excited about communication and conflict <laughs> like how conflict yeah. develops and i love confronting people which is probably <laughs> like a weird shadow part of me or something i don't know it's like <laughs> like i really love so you, conflict you, for somebody listen to this that that might not know you what you mean what i think you mean by this is one of the things you taught me actually was the concept of nonviolent communication yeah, yeah. where you take this potentially thing that could be competitive, but like there's a quick framework where you could shape it into yeah, and yeah. you could present that to the person. So you're talking about taking that more charged and then discharging it, uncharging it, and then presenting it to that person when you're talking about conflict, not necessarily walking around trying to, uh, try to just look for conflict. 
Well, yeah, exactly. Well, and I think to clarify on my side, it's like conflict exists all the time, no matter what. Like we are constantly running into our own trauma and our own inner dialogue of conflict. And a lot of times when we have conflict with other people, at least in my past, my tendency had been to not bring that up or to stay resentful and like create stories in my head about why they were doing X, Y, and Z when really it never had anything to do with me. So the way that I approach confrontation and conflict now is that anytime I see something inside of me get disturbed by someone else, I ask kind of why is that? And then I'm able to bring that up to them in a way that's also keeping them from be getting defensive. And so I use this a lot in my relationship, obviously my romantic relationship, like almost every day that we're together. Like there are, there are pieces of this framework that I use. And then there's kind of the group sessions that I do. I run, I run a men's group. I facilitate a men's group that Mitchell, you're a part of. I do a a coaching session of clients. It's about, it's between 20 and 40 clients every Wednesday evening. And I'm just constantly navigating and finding it fun to navigate difficult conversations. It's like a, it's like a game at this point for me. I'm like, how difficult can this conversation get in this uh, polarity here to where I have, I can see my skill to bring it back to like neutral. And so I was going to ask if you had any examples, whether it's like with your girlfriend, uh, at Starbucks, like, well, like where do you use this? Yeah. Yeah. Well, let me, let's talk about the framework first and then I can bring in an example. So yeah, the nonviolent communication framework is basically to start with facts and then bring in your feelings and then talk about the judgments that you've created about this person. And then how that, how this has been part of your life. And then the support request that you have of that person. This is a little bit modified from the actual nonviolent communication. It, I've taken part of this from an old group that I was in and a men's group that I was in, and then also taking it from the book. So an example with my girlfriend, for instance, there'll be times where it may be a, a more specific time is she had made an offhanded comment to me once that was like, why don't you ever tell me that I'm pretty or something like that? And to me, it was just like, ah, like, what the hell are you talking about? Like, I, in my mind, I'm like, I feel like I'd call you pretty all the time. I feel like I do this. Uh. So the way to work through that is like, first, I feel the trigger and the trigger, you know that you're triggered when it's like fight, flight, freeze kind of response, right? Like either don't, you want to avoid this. Or you have like a, you listen to your body and your body's like constricting or, or like feeling some type of way. And so I gave it a minute and I was like, okay, I need to evaluate like why this is happening within me. And then basically say the facts of the situation is like, Hey, you said that this and you try to, you facts are always something that's like irrefutable. And then you bring in the feelings that made me feel like this, right? Not you made me feel, but that particular statement made me feel like this. You always want to try to avoid attributing your own bullshit with someone else. So one of the things you can say at the beginning of this is like, you could literally call out like, what I'll do is like, Hey babe, I'm triggered. And I, this has nothing to do with you. I absolutely love you. And I want to like work through this. So can we talk about this? And you just continue to use permission based language too. That's also nonviolent communication trick. And then go through the judgments. It's like when you say that and I get this feeling, I judge that you are too hard on me or I judge that you are unable to see the other ways that I love you or I judge that you are this or this. Where that comes up in my life is I find that there are times in which I truly haven't been shown love that way and or I haven't been able to understand a partner's love language or what like you genuinely kind of related to where you're reflecting about yourself. And then you ask for the support. So my support would be that if you have requests in the future of wanting to be told something that you frame it in a positive way rather than a negative way. So instead of saying, why don't you ever do this instead of saying, babe, I'd love to have a little bit more affection in this way. And just by reframing how she says it to me, like that's mm. really fun. Like that's really crucial for me in the way that I view love and the way that I view you know, communication. So I love that because it's so applicable to so many different situations. Mm -hmm. And 
it, the beauty of it too is like, she's taking this thing, which is real for her. And so at first it's like, what, what, what is the thing? And then how, two is how does it make you feel? And then three, it's kind of like, why again about you? And like that, I think unpacks to a layer of like, wait, maybe why I was triggered in the first place. Mm-hmm. And then the last step is just like, you know, like kind of like, what's the solution quest to kind of reframe it. And then it's almost like your teammates again. Okay, hey, we're yeah. acknowledging this thing, you know, completely valid, all good, but here's just kind of what I noticed about me. How about we kind of do it this way instead? And like, it, it would be hard for that to be like, oh my God, any part of that to be like, oh my gosh, I can't believe you're saying that because it's so thoughtful in the right. step by step where it's like bringing you guys almost together. And so like, I'd imagine you had this conversation with her and then, you know, I guess what happened from there. Yeah. And just add one more thing to what you said to, to always remain on the same side, same team at the beginning. What you can say is an intention. It's like, babe, thank you for sharing that. Like you always thank the person for sharing. That's it's totally valid that you feel that way. And like thanking them and validating them up front is like, especially for women, it's like totally brings the defenses down. Right. And now we're actually having like a real connected conversation. And then say my intention with bringing this up is so that we can be on the same page and be on the same team with, with all this and make sure that you're getting the love that you deserve from me. And I know exactly how to give that love to you. And so you're always like bringing back the intention into it too, which I love. And then as you asked, like what happened after that was her and I just got it. We're like, okay, like my issue with it was not feeling good enough, which is a wound that I have from past relationships. It's my own shit. So when someone says, why aren't you doing this? Immediately I crumble. I'm like, am I not a good enough boyfriend? Am I not enough this? Am I not enough that? Like all the stories come in, right? For her, Mm -hmm. it's like, if she's not reaffirmed with words of affirmation and told that she's look good, then she thinks that she's not pretty or that her boyfriend doesn't care or whatever. So my simple thing is I'm going to show my love I'm going to make a conscious effort to show more love through words of affirmation, which is not always the way that I do it. I do it through acts of service. So that's where knowing your love language compatibility is really good. And then for her, if she has those requests, she knows that it's safe to make those requests. And it's more, it's recepted, received much easier through a positive frame. So both of us have things that we can change. And if we're both making that intentional effort, then we start to see that in each other too. We're like, oh, I see that you're trying in that way. And it's not going to be perfect, but that's such a great way to resolve conflict. (laughs) Like it used to be, if I were to resolve that maybe in the past, in the past relationship, it would be like, I show you that all the time. What are you talking about? And then all of a sudden it's butting heads and it's one against the other rather than on the same side of the table. Yeah, that's that's where my brain was going to of like, I wonder what the opposite of this, like what would be just like, which would feel most natural for people to be like, whoa, what are you talking about? Like, that's just not true. You're you're lying. I told you this the other day. Right. 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 Then it's like, it's, it's just immediately combative. That's a good example. And, um, the, I'd imagine that like, it also creates, I think like a downstream benefit of, you know, say you have this with a, a girlfriend or significant other, um, it it almost like would, I'd imagine has the, the benefit of like leveling up the relationship of like, Oh wow, this is like kind of a sophisticated way to approach a problem. Mm -hmm. And so now you guys, that's just like what you use. Same would go in, you know, the workplace with a professional relationship or with like friends. Uh, I've talked to, to other friends about, uh, about using this, whether it's like conversations with um, significant others or family members. And it's just like a cool way to be like, oh, okay. Yeah. Like, especially maybe some of those close relationships where like, y- you almost need a little bit of a framework to be like, ah, like I've just known this person so deeply for so long. Like I would need, like, it's helpful to have this kind of step-by-step way to think through it um, that, that, that might be helpful for people. Well, there's so much patterns at that point, you're communicating through patterns. So if you've known someone for years and you've been communicating with them a certain way, it's like what you have, to, what you got to consider is how can I br- actually break the pattern here? Because I have one way of responding. They have one way of responding and initiating. Like 
and it, it just becomes kind of a tug of war. And I think more to your point earlier, it's like how the end goal for me is always, how do I remain on the same team with the same objective, which is further relationship, grow, learn from each other and, and create safety. Because one of the old ways, like I'd look at relationships is if I would have fights in the relationship, it always meant something was wrong. What if conflict and fights in relationships actually meant that something was right? It's kind mm. of a crazy concept, right? But conflict in, in, in people being different and thinking about things differently, inherently, it's not bad. It actually has a huge opportunity to bring you closer, depending on how you deal with it. So if you're constantly dealing with safety and you're like, hey, yeah, like it's totally safe to be to have conflict in this relationship, then you're coming from a place where each fight doesn't mean that this could be the last one and the relationship is ended. Yeah, it's kind of like in sports, you have the like the the tough coach who rides yeah. the, you know, the, the 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 player and like later on they find out like that's good because it means they care and like want want them to get better. As soon as they stop hearing that, like hearing that conflict per se, like that's when they've kind of given up on them. And so, yeah, I like the idea of like using conflict of like, maybe it needs a better word because it has such a negative connotation around it, but like conflict is a good thing. And like, it's just a natural sort of way that we communicate and natural part of life, similar to like feedback. I think that feedback is a gift and, you know, like I, I seek that out. I think you're the similar, very similar in that regard, like conflict. I haven't never thought about it that way, but like, conflict could be in a similar category where, oh, how do I add more conflict in my life? As silly as that, as that sounds, but at least it's like a, anything else, a muscle or skill that you would develop that like, usually I wouldn't bring this up, but now I have this like framework or I have other examples of when I've done it and it has led to amazing things where I want to use conflict or maybe it's conflict resolution or however you want to think about it to uh, just using that in, in more areas of life. Yeah. I mean, for me, it's just, we're already going to navigate triggers and trauma all the time with other people. So do you want to do that from a place of safety or do you want to do that from a place of just like constant, constant defensiveness? Right. Right. Amazing. I like that a lot. So I wrote this thing last year called uh, a life investment thesis. And essentially it's like any other investment you, you have an investment thesis of like, Oh, you know, here's the macro trends. Here's what's hot. Here's like headwinds, potential tailwinds. Blah, blah, blah. So I'm going to, I'm going to enter at this price and, you know, I think it's going to keep going good. If it drops to this price, I'm going to sell whatever. And I wrote about the, is essentially kind of doing that for your life. And like, here are the things I, one of the things I think about is having like a, you know, what are my unique advantages or, you know, strengths or things that I want to double, out, double down on. So I wrote it last year. I haven't revisited it and I want to write it again this year, but also be a little bit more specific. And there, there's like a area in there where I, where I could ask for feedback from people who know me best, that sort of thing. I heard about people who are just like make predictions in general, not, not even talking in investment related at all, but just like, you know, maybe it's like where attention is going or, and it's like kind of like a, a business thing, or maybe it's like around content, whatever it is, but like having like more specific predictions, whether it's a year out or five years out is something I, I'm, I'm going to start doing and, and have, have started to think about, but I'm, I'm going to put it to paper that maybe we could talk about next time. I think it's, it's, it would be more interesting to talk about like, you know, a year from now or whenever it happens, but at least to plant the seed of like, here's an approach to, to start thinking about. And I think it's also applicable to like, you know, your work and career. Cause like, it's very easy to just be like, Oh, I'm just like kind of still doing this thing. So that's what I'm going to think about um, in, in the next month or so thoughts on that. And, or what are you going to think about? Yeah. My, constant thought and prediction is all, always around like how work gets done and how people are going to make money, especially in like the creator economy. That kind of stuff is super interesting to me. So mm -hmm. I can start thinking okay. about, uh, I already have a few potential predictions around that stuff, but start to like flush that out a little bit more for next, next time. All right, homie. Well, good stuff. And, uh, thank you all for listening and excited for, for next month until next time. Adios. Oh yeah.